Amen. Thank you. you be seated. If you haven't done so already, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. I'll tell you what verse in just a moment. Then in a little, little later, we'll be in Matthew 14, I believe. As I said, we'll be in the book of Job. We'll be in the book of Psalms. We'll be in the book of Proverbs. And you'll see how it all ties together. Now, what I want to do is to take you on a journey this morning, a journey of discovery that I pray will thrill your heart and uh, make a big difference in your own personal walk with the Lord in so many ways. But you're going to have to kind of hang in here. You're going to have to pay attention. <laughs> you, you always do, but I'm just saying, you, 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 this is one of those thinking messages because as I preach through it and show you some biblical connections and some principles, you may wonder for a little while, you know, where, where is he going with this? Well, I haven't lost, yes, I have lost my mind. But this morning, I haven't lost my mind. I know where I'm going with it. And I know how it will connect. And so I, I ask you just to hang in there with me. Now, I'm going to tell you, I don't believe I have ever preached this particular message here ever in all of the time that I've been here. I've used these scriptures before and preached from them and have revealed things that the Lord has revealed to me in these scriptures, and some of them are very, very familiar with those of you that are students of the Word. So, But what I want to share with you this morning comes from a connection of scriptures, a truth that is fairly explosive. I've written about this, and I've spoken in conferences about this, and I think on some Sunday nights I may have over the years. But I don't know that ever I've preached this on a Sunday morning. So I can tell you that you're going to want to follow with me and see these things with your eyes. Please don't come up to me after and say, now what were those scriptures again? I'm going to say, I ain't telling you. Okay? You might want to write them down. I'm going to get into some of the, the language, the original biblical language, and it's not going to be an old boring seminary class, I promise you. These things will be very important for you to hear. And so you're going to want to write those down. I promise. Don't come up to me after and say, now what was all that again? Tell me all that again. It ain't going to happen. Because I'm telling you now. Okay? Not, not too long ago, I was doing some research for something that I'm writing, and, and uh, I don't remember what it was that I put in the search engine, but it had something to do with, with what I was writing. But I, as my eyes scanned down the search results, I, I saw a title of an article that caught my name and kind of made my skin crawl a little bit. I, I knew what they meant, and I try not to be too judgmental about this, but... The longer I've been in the ministry and the more I watch things unfold, listen, I'm going to come back to that because it ties to this, but just in the last couple of weeks, and I'll get into this deeper, uh, Barna released another poll. <laughs> Out of all of the conservative evangelical pastors in America, only 37% say they have a biblical worldview. That means you can line up 100 against the wall. 60 of them will walk away when you ask them if they hold a biblical worldview. And we wonder what's wrong. This is why I say my skin crawls a little bit when I saw this. Um, see, you didn't think I was going to come back to it, did you? When, when I saw this, this, this article's title on the search engine, and I'm not judgmental about it because I know what they mean and there is a purpose for it, but... Just the title. It said, Bible Stories for Children. Okay, now, I've used that phrase in years past. We do it in children's church all the time. We look for biblical, you know, accounts and, and, and messages there that we can bring to the level of children so that they can get it at least at a child's level. Okay, so that's why I say I don't judge too harshly when I see that. But just as we move along this world as it gets 
closer to the return of the Lord. And I have to say this, those of you that are here forever, you know that I, but we've got guests and we've got people watching. I don't set dates. We don't set dates, but we just know the prophetic times we're living in and we know where it's all headed. And so when I see things like that, and then I see these polls about 60 out of every hundred pastors would have to walk away if you say, listen, do you believe what the Bible says about marriage? Do you believe what the Bible says about gender? Do you believe what the Bible says about sexuality, homosexuality, uh, adultery, fornication? Uh, uh, do, you, do you believe what the Bible says about the sanctity of the womb? Do you believe what the Bible says about the return of Israel and what a sign that is? Do you believe in the prophetic understanding of your times? Do you, this biblical worldview measuring every Everything through the Word of God in context, 60 of them will walk away and say, well, we don't really stand right there. 40 of them will stay. So when I see titles like that, and then I, I, I realize that what happens is you can take something like the Garden of Eden or the Flood or what we're going to look at this morning, and you... you you can make those palatable and understandable for children. I don't have a problem with that. I'm beginning to develop, and most of you know, a problem with the word story, only because language changes. And now when we say story, it, it's almost equal to like a fairy tale. You know, the Bible stories. No, they're biblical accounts of things that really happened in real history and real people's lives. Now, again, I'm parsing words because I'm using the word account, and maybe one day that'll be changed into something flimsy. But the word story kind of makes my skin crawl when I see the, you know, Bible stories. Because, see, here's the problem. There are a lot of adults sitting in a lot of churches that never got beyond the children's version. See, that's what I'm saying. So it's okay to have... A biblical account and bring it to the level that a child can grasp it. We want our children to understand at least the, the foundational message of the Garden of Eden and of Noah's flood. If we told them everything that it meant, their eyes would be that big and their hair would be pinned back. But they'll get it one day. They'll grow into it as they grow in the Word. And if they're in a good family that teaches and prays with them and a good church that preaches and teaches it and good Bible classes on Sunday mornings, they'll get it and they'll understand and they'll grow and they'll become really solid, contextual, biblical worldview people that God has his hand over and blesses and anoints. But I'm just telling you, what happened in the Garden of Eden is not a children's story. It's not mythology. I mean, take a look around. Eight billion people on the planet. And look. Look at the flood of evil and wickedness and depravity and derangement of mind that is sweeping the planet. It's like every time some politician comes behind a microphone and opens their mouth, I don't care who they are, my skin crawls. Did you just say that? What? And when they start quoting scripture, that's when I just really lose it. I mean, this is the world we're living in. It's getting worse and worse, and now it's 24-7 information communication systems, and we're being bombarded continually, so it's just even more apparent to us. And so I'm going to take you to some biblical accounts that have also been relegated to children's stories. And I can understand because they're filled with intrigue and excitement and some power. And of course, miracles and things that seem otherworldly. Well, they are otherworldly. See, we're so in love with this world and the rudimentary physical things of it that sometimes we forget there's a new world coming. And there used to be a world that was in our midst it was way different from this mess that's here now. And it's coming again. If you read the Word of God, Genesis 3 tells you what happened, why it happened, and the results of it. And then Revelation 22 tells you God fixed it all through Jesus Christ, and He's bringing it back. That's why we're here. That's why we worship. So the Word of God is clear about all of this, but in the midst of it, or things like the flood, you know. And, 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 and so we go to the children's literature about it, and we see a great big colorful thing, and 
an elephant with a head the size of this building standing in an ark, you know, old man with a white beard and a cane standing up there and a giraffe whose neck reaches to the heavens and rainbows and beautiful, you know. And that's about as far as most of the church ever gets, not realizing that was when God pushed the reset button and killed everything in his judgment, in his righteous, righteous judgment. Because all flesh had become corrupted and people did whatever they wanted to do in their flesh and with their flesh and even the flesh of animals, it was corrupted too. God had to pull out the only family that was left that had not corrupted their flesh and brought animals to Noah. He brought them to Noah. He didn't tell Noah to go out and get them. He said, I'm bringing them to you because he knew which ones had not been corrupted. And now we would know scientifically probably in their DNA. Even the humans. That's why God brought them. The rest of it, he destroyed. Now that'll give children nightmares right there. And a lot of adults don't want to deal with it either, so they just stick with the children's story. And the pretty colors and the long-necked giraffes. Are you following me? Now remember, I'm not standing here in judgment because I've been a part of all of that growing up, you know, and all these years and watching all of that happen and even have said some of those things. Hey, come on up, children, we're going to give you a Bible story. You know, so I'm not judging. I'm just saying that we're in a time now when 60% of our pastors, conservative evangelical pastors, won't even stand on the contextual worldview of biblical worldview. We're living in a time now where we better be very, very clear as to what the Word of God says, and what we believe it says, and keeping it in context, and then doing our best as God's people, encouraging each other to live it. Amen, church? Amen. It's just called being real. Real with ourselves, real with each other, and trying to be a real church. I don't know that any church is perfectly real. <laughs> but it doesn't hurt to work towards it, right? <laughs> being humble, because you're going to fail along the way. And you got to tweak, and you got to back up. We're blessed to be in a very real church, not perfect, never has been, but it's, it is real. And, and I hear it all the time from folks that are, especially newer folks that have come in and have not tasted of a church like this in a long, long time. And so I praise God for that, but humbly I say, thank you, Jesus, help us to keep it that way. In fact, help us to make it even more real, you know, just live it real, preach it, teach it real, what it really says in context. And finally move beyond the milk into the meat, beyond the children's understanding, which they need, but into the full-grown adult understanding. Everybody with me? All right, now follow me. We're going to go, let's start with Matthew chapter 8, to a passage of Scripture. You've heard me preach and teach from it many times, but just follow with me. I'm going to unpack a journey Verse 22, uh, 23, yeah, verse 23. Then Jesus got into the boat. He was with his disciples down on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, and his disciples followed him. So they're in the boat together. They push off from shore. They head out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Matthew's just getting quickly right to the point, like some of you are saying you wish I would. In verse 24 says, Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake, so that the waves came up on the lake, so that, excuse me, so that the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. He was sleeping in the back of the boat. The disciples went. They woke him up saying, Lord, save us. We're going to drown in the storm. He replied. Again, Matthew's just getting to this. All, there's got to be all kinds of things going on during the storm and the waves and the wind and the lightning and the thunder. And the, they're screaming at him. And I don't, maybe he just stays there and looks at him and smiles. Maybe he gets up and looks around. I, but whatever. But he just he says to them, you of little faith. Why are you so afraid? <laughs> then he got up 
He rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. You, I don't know the words he used, but he stood up, and the boat's doing this, and the disciples are doing this, and the lightning is striking, the waves are coming over the boat, and the boat is rocking, maybe even in the flesh. I mean, he, maybe even he had to hold on to something, but then he lifts his hands, and he says, Stop! Peace! Be still. And at his voice, and everything slicks off. No more lightning is heard except in the distant thunder rolling. As all of a sudden, at his voice, it all stops. Instant calm is brought. Now, I don't know at that point which would be more terrifying, being in the storm or watching that happen. I mean, think with me. Well, well I call if I was there, I'd have, I wouldn't have been. If you were there and he stood and spoke to the wind and to the waves and instantly they obeyed him. I don't know. I'd have felt a little faint. Verse 27. The men were amazed. That's not a very good word. <laughs> you see, Matthew's just getting to the point. Bless his heart. I don't know all the words to use. The men were flabbergasted. The men were blown away. No pun intended. The men, the men, the men were absolutely stunned. The men were frozen in place. The men were terrified. How can somebody talk to the wind in the oceans? And they obey him. I mean, they're glad that their life is saved because it looked like they were going to die. He's sleeping in the back of the boat. It had been a long, long day. He was out like a light. He gets up from a stupor of sleep, speaks to the wind and the waves, and instantly they stop. And then he looks at them with those eyes that pierce to their souls. And he said, did you not believe? You know, basically what he's saying is you were in the boat with me. Why would you think something was going to happen to us? I told you to get in the boat and go with me to the other side. Did you not think we were going to make it to the other side? But there's a storm. But a storm. There's always a storm. Have y'all no noticed that? And there's always a storm in your life and my life somewhere. There's always a storm somewhere in the world. And sometimes they are horrendous. Sometimes they're real storms. We're in Hurricane Alley. We know what that's about. And all of them are real, but I'm in a literal windy, rainy lightning storm, but, but I mean, there are wars and rumors of wars and nations against nations and kingdoms against kingdoms. And now we've got nukes and satellite warfare technology and bio weapons. And there's always a storm somewhere. And Jesus looks at his children and says, I can get you to the other side. Have a little faith and just hang on for the ride. Everybody with me so far? Okay. Go to Matthew chapter 14. Here's something similar, but it is a different account. It's not like a repeating of the same one. It's a different one in the life and ministry of Jesus in the three years of ministry. He's just fed a crowd of 5,000 people. That was an all-day affair, preaching, teaching, ministering uh, 5,000 men, it says. And of course, that's kind of how they counted the crowds, which I don't know. I mean, figure at least one woman for every man, whether they're married or not. You just kind of, you know, do that. And then kids, so two or three, I, I don't know, 15,000 or more people there. And there's a miraculous feeding. 
That makes for a good children's story. But can you imagine if you were there and put it in real life? If you had experienced it, if you had seen it. So he speaks to the wind and the waves and they obey him. Now he doesn't even speak. He just says, give it to me. And the next thing you know, it is multiplying, multiplying, multiplying until their bellies are filled and they're taking up baskets of leftovers. And the people are thronging and crowding in. They're going crazy. They're praising him. They're worshiping him. Some, some are even wanting to take him by force and make him their king so that they can defeat the Roman government and the Roman armies here as a miracle worker and one that can feed them and heal them with a touch. Can you imagine sh soldiers going into battle that even when they're wounded, he just speaks and they're healed and they keep up and get going? And they don't need food shipped in on trucks because all he has to do is take a few loaves of bread and a few fish. And he, I mean, they saw that. They were thinking that, folks, I'm telling you. War, they kept him wore out, humanly speaking. A lot of times he had to escape into the mountains and to kind of get away from it all. Watch this. Matthew 14. Verse 22. So immediately after all this was over and the people just went berserk, Jesus made his disciples get into the boat. There they were again down at the lake, Capernaum, and go on ahead of him to the other side. Well, you don't just walk around the Sea of Galilee. I mean, you can, but it's, it's quite a journey. I'm, I'm surprised. That, I'm sure they did. The biblical account doesn't have the disciples going, well, how the heck are you going to get over there? You know, other boats, maybe, whatever. We don't know. He's just getting to the point. He's not filling in all the gaps. But I want your mind to fill in those gaps. I, I want this to be as real and as physical as it can be to you in your mind and soul because it's not just a children's story. You're going to see in a dramatic way in a minute. So they told him to go on to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, how did he do that? Y'all get out of here now, him. Y'all go on home. I'm, I'm wore out. I don't know. How would he dismiss them? Y'all, shoo, 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 shoo. I, but aren't y'all glad I didn't write the Bible? You couldn't even carry it around with you. I'd fill in all those gaps. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountain by himself to pray. Yeah, I feel his pain. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat that the disciples were in was already a considerable distance from land. And it was being buffeted by the waves because the wind was now against it. And during the fourth watch of the night, it would be early in the morning, but black, Jesus went out to them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. That's a pretty good word, but again, I could expound on it if I had 15 minutes, but I'm running out of time, so I don't. How would you have felt? They cried out to each other. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. This is not even real. This can't be real. Who is this? What is this? And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus said to them, this would be above the wind and the waves and the lightning and the crashing. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. And the wind's blowing and that he's off in the distance and they're looking at this ghostly figure coming across the lake. And, and then Peter, the shy one, Lord, if it's you out there, then you tell me to come to you on the water. In other words, he's going to put him to the test, going to lay out a fleece. Those of you familiar with the biblical account of Gideon, Judges chapter 6. Chapter, I mean, verse 29. Jesus, here's, here's all Matthew says. Come, he said. 
<laughs> I imagine this is what it was. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come out there. Jesus probably went, <laughs> come on, big boy. It's me. Who are you thinking? Of? You know anybody else that can do this? Come on. Matthew says, Jesus says, come, he said. <laughs> I know this is the word of God. I'm not making fun of it, but some of these guys, they, they should have put a little bit more in there. <laughs> but watch. Come. Come. So Peter got down out of the boat. He walked on the water. He came towards Jesus. You got to give Peter credit for that. I, I, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> I'm just going to sit here and tell you. <laughs> Don't think I would have done it. I mean, maybe, maybe, but I've been on the water in a storm before. And at night. It's one of the most terrifying things ever. Some of you guys have been in the military, been out on ships in the middle of the ocean. I've never done that before in the middle of storms. It's... Uh, the ones I've been in have made me think that was the last day of my life. I can't imagine something like that. And this is what they're in. And I don't think I would have got out of the boat. <laughs> Makes for good preaching, though, doesn't it? Well, at least Peter got out of the boat, you know. And good preaching. Some good stuff there, but that's not where I'm going yet, believe it or not. Jesus reached out his hand. And he caught him. Well, it was as Peter got out of the boat. He walked on the water and he, and he went towards Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink, crying out, Lord, save me. In other words, he got out there. He started and he realized, I'm walking, I'm walking. And, but but it's still, it's storming, guys. White caps, big waves crashing over the boat, lightning striking. And, and, and he's, you know, he's looking around. Going, oh, what have I done? Man, that's stupid. How much further can I go? Oh, my gosh. And he said, come on, come on. I can't. You know, it's like a child learning how to swim. I don't want to anymore. That's as far as I want to go. And he took his eyes off Jesus, and he begins to sink. And so there's another good sermon right there. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, and he caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt and when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. And I would want to say, gee, you think? <laughs> I mean, they had already been in a boat with him where he spoke to the wind and the waves. And they did, at least there they said, Who is this? Who's this that's in the boat with us that he can speak to the wind and the waves? And they obey him. All right, everybody with me so far? Amen. All right, keep those in the back of your mind for a moment. I want to take you on a little Hebrew language journey, and this is very, very important to where I'm going to eventually wind up, but you're, you're going to want to hear this and even write some of it down. Um, to this day, the Orthodox Jews, and even those that call themselves believers. I'm not judging them when I say call themselves. You have to say that about everybody now, don't you? <laughs> they call themselves a believer. <laughs> but even those that call themselves believers that are what they would call into the Messianic roots movement and all of that, they, in, in the Orthodox Jews, they would say, we don't, we, don't, we don't say the name. We don't speak the name of God because it's, it's unbiblical. It's unholy to speak his name. What name are they talking about? They're talking about the name, the Tetragrammaton, yud he -he. We pronounce it, uh, we don't really know exactly how it was pronounced in ancient days because Hebrew uh, words are made up of what they call roots, root words. And most Hebrew words start with just three or four consonant sounds, and that's it. And then you have to know from the ancient times now into the modern times, how those consonants fit together and what kind of what we would call vowel sounds go with the consonants depending upon where they're located in the root. It's, it gets very, very complex. So we really don't know exactly how it would be pronounced, but you hear it often pronounced as Yahweh. Yud, he, wa, he. You can hear that. Yahweh. Okay, adding some vowel sounds in there. Sometimes you'll hear it Yahweh with a V, because that Vav, that letter Vav, can be pronounced Vav or Wa, and depending. And that comes out of Hebrew history and various places where people lived. It's kind of like if you live in the north, it's root six. 
If you live in the South, it's Route 6. Okay? So it depends on where you live, how you say it. And so that's Vav or Wa. So some people, Yahweh. Some people, Yahweh. But something like that is how it's pronounced. You've, you've, you've heard me preach this before, and I'm going to have to stick it in here very quickly so that you'll understand everywhere that I'm going with this. But in the proto synatic alphabet, which was the alphabet that goes way back, I mean, almost a lot of the world's modern alphabets and languages came out of that, especially in the Middle East, but even in some English-speaking countries. And so, and, but, but then that developed eventually into what's called the, the, uh, the Paleo-Hebrew. And then that was an ancient form of Hebrew that the original documents were written in, the original Hebrew documents. And so it's an ancient form. It's not exact, it doesn't look exactly the same as the modern Hebrew. The same letters, they've just taken different shapes. But in those ancient forms, the letters also had meanings attached to them, kind of like our icons. You know, if you see a picture of a stick man and a stick woman on a door, it used to mean male's bathroom and female's bathroom. Used to mean. Okay. Everything changes, right? But so, so the Hebrew letters, ancient Hebrew letters did that too. You could take the letter and it would make a sound and you could make words and then you could express your thoughts. But each letter also had a meaning with it that was kind of a, what we'd call an ideogram or an ideograph, an idea that went with it so that you could express it by just taking the letter. I'll tell you a perfect letter. Uh, you know what a Hebrew mezuzah is? It's a little prayer box thing that you'll see on the doors of, of Jewish homes or businesses. And on the middle of it is emblazoned. It looks, in our alphabet, it looks like a W, but it's not. It looks very similar to that. And it's called the sheen. Or it could be seen because that's a letter that has a couple of two ways that you can use it so they don't have an H in their language like we do. So, so where we can take an S and put an H and it has a sh sound or a hard S, a s. So the sheen is like that sheen or seen depending upon the word and how it's all laid out. Okay, but watch. I hope I'm not getting too boring. This is going to get really exciting in a moment, but just hang in here. So, so the point is it's a difficult language. But it's mysterious in a lot of ways, but it's also very powerful because of this, these ideas, ideograms. A lot of the ancient languages had this kind of stuff though. Okay. But, but each one would have its own pictographic or ideographic meaning. So again, it's like now we can just draw a stick figure and put it on a door and everybody can kind of figure out if it's a male or female and they'll know. All right? So it's similar to that because then you could just take the sheen and it is put on every mezuzah. There's millions of them all over the world. Millions of Jews that have them and the millions of people that aren't Jews that think they're cool and they've got them. I've got one in my house. It was given to me as a gift from, from Israel many years ago when you guys sent me there, our tour guide. We just got to be really good friends with him. He came to the United States and was bringing Israelis over, and he came to our house. My, we had him in the pulpit here one Sunday night, if you were here back in those days. And he gave my wife and I a very expensive, a very beautiful mezuzah, and it's been on the door frame on the inside of our house ever since he gave it to us. And right in the middle of it is emblazoned a single letter, Sheen. Well, what is that? Well, that's the sheen. Well, what does it do? It helps to make words. It's either sh or s. Well, why is it on the prayer box? Because it also has a meaning that goes with it. The meaning is so ancient, we don't know exactly, but more than likely, it is because it is the singular letter that represents the word, which is the name of God, Shaddai. El Shaddai meaning God Almighty. And so it represents that God Almighty, His hand and blessing is over this house or this business. And inside is Deuteronomy 6. Hear you, Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord thy God is one. Okay, it's called a mezuzah. And it's there. And it's got a single letter, but the letter is filled with meaning. And it's the name of God, El Shaddai. Is everybody with me? So, when you look at that tetragrammaton, and, and I've preached on this before, 
Each of those letters have meaning. Yud, hey, wah, hey. Many of you have heard this before. But I'm going to go somewhere else in a moment. But hang on. This is just setting up everything. So Yud. Well, there's two letters in there. You know, there are two times one letter is there. Hey, Yud, hey, wah, hey. Yahweh or Yahweh, depending. Yud, hey, wah, hey. Hey, 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 hey. Believe it or not, the meaning of that is, look at that or behold. See, it. I know you say, well, that's easy to remember, like, hey! <laughs> but it, it wasn't trying to match itself to the English language, all right? It's just the sound of the letter. But it's easy to remember what it means. It's behold, look, look at that, pay attention, hey! Yud, hey. Behold the yud. Listen, you can go, there's a couple of... Uh, Listen, I, I'm not just making this up. And some people would say, well, you know, they don't do that anymore in the Hebrew language. Oh, yes, they do. The sheen proves it on millions of masuzas. There's a one letter that has a meaning. And every Jew knows what it means. Don't tell me they don't use these anymore. They do, which is going to explain a problem they got and something they did and where this message is going and how it relates back to what you just saw. And it's going to... Knock your socks off when you see it. So hang in here with me. But you can go to a place like HebrewToday.com, which is a modern, professional Hebrew language learning site. And um, they have all the meanings of the letters and so much more. I mean, they, do, they print newspapers for, for people that are learning Hebrew as well as people that are already well-versed in Hebrew. They have classes. Teach. But teachers in Israel, in the public schools and private schools, use their material. All right, so they're scholarly, and, but they also go all the way back to the ancient. See, the modern Hebrew doesn't have the letters and then, oh, and here's the meaning to it. it, it that's just something that was a part of their past, but it's so ingrained in their past that on the mezuzah, they'll put Shin El Shaddai. Okay? Hebrew today, this teaching modern Hebrew will also teach you the meanings of the letters. The yud represents the hand. In fact, the word hand in Hebrew is yod. See, you're using the yud in the whole word, and so it's yod, hand. Behold the hand. The vav or the wa represents a peg, a nail, a spike, a hook, or a spear. What is the meaning of your name, God? Behold the hand, behold the nail, and then you will know the meaning of the name of the Most High. Behold the hand, behold the spear, behold the hand, behold the, well, peg is the same thing as nail or a spike, you, you forget, the hook, your, the hook between heaven and earth, hooked to a cross with nails spiked, with a spear rammed in his side, with his hands and feet pinned. You want to know what my name means? Yud, hey, wa, hey. Behold the hands. Behold the nails. Y'all have heard this before from me. Many of you have. But it's still powerful, isn't it, every time you hear it? Amen. Like, how can that be? Because no Jewish person would ever have invented those meanings because it points to Jesus Christ on the cross. Now follow me. I had to tell you that so that you would know what we're getting ready to hear. So back in the second temple period, that is they had the first temple that Solomon built, then the Babylonians destroyed it, and then the Persians eventually allowed them to start rebuilding it. And so in about three, four, five hundred years before Christ comes in the Christ event, they're in the process of building the second temple. They never did really get it complete, which is why in Jesus' day, Herod, the puppet king of Rome, was always leveling temple taxes because he was adding to it and adding to it. And in Jesus' day, it was known as Herod's temple. He named it after himself because he was adding to it and trying to restore it to its glory so the people that he was the ruler over for the Roman government would love him <laughs> as he took their money. Y'all love me now. I'm going to take your money. And I know you're not eating, but I'm going to make the temple look beautiful. 
I know your children are starving in the streets, but I'm going to put gold all over the temple, and you're going to love me for it, and I'm going to take your tax money. That's why they hated Herod. Is everybody with me so far? Amen. Brings the Bible alive when you know this stuff. But from the time that the temple started being rebuilt, several hundred years before Christ, up to that time, it was kind of a superstition that arose among the Jews, and the rabbis started it. Okay, that you shouldn't speak the name of Yahweh. Now, the reason they were saying it was because they had seen what Nebuchadnezzar had done to the temple. Now they're rebuilding it. They're thinking, we don't ever want that to happen again. So we got to think of some way to please God. We need to honor his name and revere it so much that we won't even speak it. Now, that's a warped way of thinking because all through the Bible, God says, honor my name, use my name, sing my name, praise my name. There's not a single scripture anywhere that says never use my name. There's a commandment that says don't take my name in vain. And they use that to say that's what God meant. No, it's not. He said as you're using my name, don't use it flippantly. Don't take it in vain. Take it. Use it. Praise me. Sing. Tell others about me. Tell of my glory. Get others into the kingdom with it, but don't use it as a curse word or, or I swear to God, you know, just flippantly throwing it out there. He says, don't do that. Everybody with me? But yet they were so paranoid about losing the second temple and somehow displeasing God that the, the priests and the rabbis would, would begin to, would, would try to spread it among the people not to use the name. But not only did it not really stick for all those years, we have documents, ancient documents from New Testament manuscripts written in Greek that whenever that name is in the Greek, we've got manuscripts that show that it's written out in the Greek manuscripts in the time of Jesus, which means a lot of people were not obeying the superstitions of the rabbis. Is everybody with me? I know some of you thinking, I didn't come here to come out of seminary class. Well, you can leave if you want, but you're going to sure miss what's coming next. What's coming next wouldn't mean a thing to you if I didn't tell you all this. So, what they devised was a way of speaking and writing Something that represented the name of God, but it was not yud heh wah -Hey. But then after the Christ event, then after Jesus goes to the cross, and then the rabbi started seeing those letters. Because believe me, they checked the letters out of all kinds of names. And why do you think John says in Revelation, he says, in the number of his name, the beast is 666. See, that comes out of the Hebrew mindset. Every letter had a numerical value. It had a meaning. It had something. I mean, this, it's all in the Bible. And it's all through Hebrew history if you know it. Most of today's church doesn't. Shoot, 60% of our pastors don't even have a biblical worldview. They sure don't have a clue about what we're talking about right now. Amen. But what I'm getting ready to tell you is powerful. As powerful, if not more so, than the yud heh wah -Hey. But I had to tell you that to bring you to this point. Because what happens is you got these, the rabbis and the priests trying to push this superstition on the people and it never really sticks. It just sticks among their own ranks, you know, at the temple and all that. Oh, don't say the name. Don't say the name. Harry, I told you not to use that name. Okay? But after the Christ event and they looked at Psalm 22, <laughs> behold, they have pierced my hands and my feet. They're gambling for my clothing under my feet. They looked at Zechariah chapter 12. And on that day you will look upon me whom you have pierced. But you will mourn for him as an only son. Or how about Isaiah 53? He was wounded for our the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon his back. He was pierced for our transgressions, wounded for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was laid upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. They saw all of that about the piercing, the beating, the crucifixion is what they were looking at. Even gambling for clothing. That was written a thousand years before it happened. And now they're living in the midst of it. They're the ones that put him on the cross. They're watching that. Jesus resurrects. He ascends. 
uh, the church is born, and within a few decades after that, the temple is destroyed again by the Romans. And the Jews are scattered. The Roman legions come into Jerusalem and Judah and Judea and scatter them to the winds. Only to come back in the year 1948. But now we have documents from the second century, which would, would be in the first and second century from the Jewish people that were scattered where they devised a system again, and basically now they were forcing it upon the people. Do you see what happened? You used that name too much, and God tore the temple down again. Where are they getting that from? It's not in the Bible. They're just making it up. So they came up with this. And even today, I see people on the Internet. They'll, they, sometimes they'll write G-D. You see that? Because we don't want to speak the name. These are Christians. Okay? But, but they call themselves, well, we're doing it the Jewish way. You mean the ones that put him on the cross? You're going to do it that way? Okay. The ones that didn't believe? Okay. <laughs> the ones that went to the Romans and connected with them? See, I got people now just mad at me right now. I'm telling you. But wait, it gets better. So they'll do that. But then they came up with this phrase. Hashem. Hashem, that's what we will call him. Well, now you've heard me say this a million times in the last couple of months. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Right? Baruch means praise be. Hashem means to the name, the name. ha la shem name. Baruch Hashem Adonai. Praise be to the name of the Lord. You got it? So, they say, so now you'll see it written or spoken, Hashem, Hashem. Or oh, Hashem says, and Hashem did, and Hashem has directed us. And, and what they're saying, the name has directed us, the name, the name, the name. No, well, that's okay, because they know what they're doing. They're referring to yud heh wah -Hey. But the problem is, after the Christ event, and after the temple was destroyed, which was God's decree from heaven, because the new temple is us. The Bible says it, Paul says it, Jesus said it. So that one had to go. Otherwise, everybody would worship it. And now it's not there anymore. And we're the temple that's rising in the last days, and 60% of our preachers don't even hold a worldview, biblical worldview. You see how close we are, guys? Y'all please say amen or yes or no or something. Thank you. Thank you. I just, good gosh, it gets lonely up here. When I see a bunch of people and I say something, everybody goes... Okay, follow me. Now follow me. Hashem. So we don't speak that name because we don't want to say Yahweh because it means behold the hands, behold the nails. And we put him there. And the temple is gone again. So to keep our heritage and our tradition is Hashem. <laughs> Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> ha is spelled with He. What does He mean in its meaning? Behold. The second letter, ha shi im shi sh. That's the sheen. Behold, God Almighty. You know what meme means? On the water. Behold, God Almighty. Walking on the water. But wait, it gets way better than that. The word for water in Hebrew is mayim. It's got two mems in it. That's the letter that makes up. It's 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 he 
Shin, Mem. Those three consonants, He, Shin, Mem, and then the vowel sounds is Hashem. You hear Hashem? The name. And it includes who is God Almighty, the Shen, if you're using the meanings. Hashem, the name of God Almighty. But we're not going to say that name because it says, Behold the hands, behold the necks. Hashem, if you take the meanings of each of those letters, they're ancient, ancient, ancient meanings. It means, Behold God Almighty on the waters. Mayim is the Hebrew word for water. It's spelled with a mem and the letter ayin. And boy, that's another whole preaching I could do and I don't have time for that. And then the last letter is an, a mem. And if you're into the Hebrew, that's a, it's the letter and then the final form of the letter. So both of the letter, there's two letter mems. That's, I'm getting too deep. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'm not trying to make Hebrew speaking people out of you or readers. But the bottom line is I just want you to hear this mayim, this water, this water, this water. Okay, now. Behold God on the water. Behold God walking on the water. Whoops. So immediately we think of what I just read. These are not children's stories. Now, do children need to understand them? Yes. Do we need to bring them down and get the meanings out of them and all the preaching and teaching? Yes. But Jesus does these things. He's not showing off. He's not, this is not something that you open the pages of the Bible and say, oh, that sounds a little weird. Here's one. Okay, yeah, it's amazing. He's showing them he's God in the flesh. Zechariah 12 says, and on that day you will look upon me whom you have pierced. But you will call him the only son and you will mourn for him. What was Jesus before he went to the cross showing his disciples? Walking on the water and speaking to the wind and the waves. I am Yahweh in the flesh. I'm your Savior. I'm your Messiah. I've come to go to the cross. And now I am God Almighty in the flesh walking on the water right in front of you. Oh, you of little faith. Did you know not? Did you not believe? Did you know not? Now follow me. Go to the book of Job. It's right before. You got Job. You got Psalms. You got Proverbs right in the middle of your Bible. The book of Psalms are right in the middle of your Bible. Go to Job chapter 9. Because now we got to ask, okay, Hashim. To this day, there are Christians who won't speak the name of God. They'll write G-D or they'll say Hashim, Hashim says, Hashim says, because they think they're being good little Jewish people. And the whole thing is because we, the, we've got documents from the first and second century saying that that's when it kind of became law among the Jews. Don't speak that name. Yet the Bible says speak his name, sing his name, praise his name, bless his name. Don't abuse it. Don't use it in vain. It's one of the commandments. But use it. Proclaim it. to the, the angels sing his name. We are supposed to sing his name. But the Orthodox Jews who hate the name of Jesus, they hate the New Testament documents. They hate everything that's in it. They said, we're not saying that name. We will say Hashim. And it'll include God Almighty in the midst of it with the sheen that's on every mezuzah. Are y'all seeing how all this connects? But right there, we've got El Shaddai walking on the water. And he's presenting himself to his disciples. And that's why he's getting on to them. Because he's told them over and over who he is. And he's showing them now. They said... In Matthew chapter 8, they said, Who is this that speaks to the wind and to the waves? That's why Jesus chewed them out. He, should, he, he basically said, Why do you even ask that question? What, what do you mean, who is this? What do you mean, who am I? You know anybody else that can command the elements? We just finished feeding 15,000 people with a few loaves of bread and a few fish. Because I spoke something into existence, like Genesis 1-1.
And now I'm here in the flesh doing what only God can do because God created the wind and the waves and the elements. He commands them. And you've seen me. We just fed 5,000 people. And now we're in a boat. And now you see me walking across the waters or you see me speaking to the wind and to the waves. And they obey me. Who do you think I am? Oh, you of little faith. So now the question is, all right, but that's New Testament stuff. I mean, if you're going to say, show all this to a Jewish person, they're going to say, and you can ask them, but do, is there anything in the Old Testament about God walking on the water? Their first answer will be no. No, because that sounds too much like you're Jesus. And then you take them to where I'm going to show you. Go to Job chapter 9. Good if I could get there. Verse 1, Bildad, his friend, is talking to him and telling Job about how God works and how he doesn't work because Job is suffering greatly and he's wondering what's God doing, what's going on. Bildad talks to him. Job replies, Indeed, Bildad, I know this is true, what you've said, but how can a mortal be righteous before God? A mere human Though one wished to dispute with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. His wisdom is profound. His power is vast. Who has resisted God and come out unscathed? He moves mountains without them even knowing it. He overturns them in his anger. He shakes the earth from its place. He makes its pillars tremble. He speaks to the sun and it does not shine. He seals off the light of the stars. He alone stretches out the heavens. He alone walks on the waters of the sea. He alone. So when Jesus does it, guess who he is? Guess what he's showing his disciples? Guess why he chews them out about it? But it gets better. Go to Psalm 77. Let's just start at verse 13. Psalm 77, verse 13. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God, little g, is so great as our God, big G? And, and, and what that reads in Hebrew is, what Elohim is so great as our Elohim? See, it's the same word, but there's a context to it. One is the angelic or the fallen realm or the, or the angels, the sons of God. But then there's God himself who's the daddy of them all, of us all. He says, but you are the Elohim who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, even the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. And your path led right through the sea, your way through the mighty waters, and your footprints were not even seen. Are y'all following me? Now, all of y'all that didn't pull out your Bibles and didn't pull out notes, aren't y'all sad? Well, we'll get it from you later. No, you won't. You won't. You can't, you can't just come and just listen to something and go out and you, you got, guys, I'm telling you, 60% of pastors and churches do that. You've got to get in the Word. You've got to know all this history. You've got to know the language. You've got to know the context. You put it together, and there's where God reveals His mysteries. He doesn't reveal His treasures, the pearls of great price, to people who flippantly sling them around, pastors included. Are you all following me? But to those who love His Word... Those who love the Son. Those who would dare say, Baruch Hashem Adonai. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> but it gets better. Go to Psalm 107. I'm 
almost ready to wrap this up, but this is, this is important stuff, guys. It has to do with where we're living right now. Just follow me. I've told you I'm making, I'm making my case. Psalm 107, verse 27. So this is about people. They're out, they're, they're out in a boat. They're out in the oceans. And it says, and they reeled and they staggered like drunken men. They're in the midst of a storm. They were at their wits. And as I read this, think of the disciples. This almost reads exactly like that. Watch. So out in the middle of a the storm, they reeled. They staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' ends. And then they cried out to the Lord in the midst of their trouble. And he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. And they were glad when it grew calm. And then he guided them to their desired haven. That's what happened with Jesus and the disciples in Matthew chapter 8. They cried out to him, Help us, we're drowning, we're drowning. He gets up and he says, Peace, be still. And he calms the wind, he calms the waves, and he takes them to the other side. And they were glad. Are you following me? Amen. Now go to Proverbs 30, and we're going to start wrapping this up. Proverbs 30. Notice I threw the word start in there. <laughs> I'm being funny, don't panic. Proverbs 30. Uh. Start with verse 2. Verse 1 is the big introduction of who wrote it and what, but this is over a thousand years before the Christ event. I am the most ignorant of men. I do not have a man's understanding. I have not learned wisdom, nor... Have I knowledge of the Holy One? Who has gone up to heaven and come down? Y'all look at me. Look at me. Y'all look at me. <laughs> We're going to keep going. This is important. Who has gone up to heaven and come down? What did Jesus say to Nicodemus? What did Jesus say? He's, he's quoting this. He is the one who's come down from heaven and has gone up again and is coming back again. And no one has done that, he said, before him. No one. Now, in the meantime, we know of two people in the New Testament or in the whole Bible that were actually allowed to go up into the throne room, into the presence of God. That was Paul and that was John. And that was only because it was after the resurrection, after the church is born. Now the blood has opened the way to the Holy of Holies. And those two guys were given invitations and the portal was opened and they walked through another dimension and they're at the throne of God and they both have visions of the end times. And Paul wrote half of our New Testament and John wrote the book of Revelation. Are y'all following me? But prior to that, ain't nobody done that. They could only, they couldn't because the way had not been opened. But in the blood of Jesus, it has. So this proverb starts off, who has gone up into heaven and come down? Watch this. Who has gathered up the winds in the hollow of his hands? Who has wrapped up the waters, the maim? In his cloak. Who has established the ends of the earth. That is created. What is his name. And the name of his son. Surely. You know. It's right there. One thousand years. Before Jesus steps his foot. What is his name. Is Yahweh. What's the name of his son? Yeshua. What does that mean in English? Salvation. How many times have I taken that name salvation, that word salvation, and put the name of Jesus when I read Old Testament scriptures to you? Like in the Psalms where it says, God has become our Jesus. What? It says salvation, but the name is Yeshua. We're just asked right here, who has taken up the winds in his hands? Who's wrapped the waters in his own cloak? What is his name? Well, that would be Yahweh, the creator. Who's brought the foundations of the earth together? That would be Yahweh, the creator. And what's his son's name? That would be Yeshua. 
And the guy that writes the Proverbs 1,000 years before he ever set foot, he says, surely you know his name. How would you know? Because all through the Bible it says, and God has become our Yeshua. God is our Yeshua. He is our light and our Yeshua. Over and over and over and over it is said. That's why on that night before Jesus went to the cross in John chapter 14, <laughs> Philip said, Lord, if you would just show us the Father. Remember his answer? Have I been with you so long and you still do not know who I am? If you have seen me, Philip, you have seen the Father. It's right there. Water. Genesis chapter 1. And he separated the Mayim from the heavens and the Mayim below. I mean, it starts with the separating of the waters. And then you move through to Exodus and they backed up to the Red Sea. And what does God do? He separates the waters so the people can walk across on dry ground. How about when they come into the promised land 40 years later and Joshua standing at the Jordan River with its banks over flooded and overflowed. He says, get the priest, get the ark, start singing praises, start blowing the trumpets and head to the river. But the river swallowed, just do it. And the waters part. The Maim. Why? Because God on his throne says, peace be still, part I created you. You do what I tell you now. Water, water, water. Right before Jesus would go to the cross, he would be in the land of the Samaritans. He sends his disciples to town to get some food. He sits down in the middle of the day at a well. She's a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans and Jews hated each other. Jesus doesn't hate anybody. And he was trying to teach his disciples not to hate women and Samaritans and, you know, all the stuff that the nasty culture they were living in. I'm so glad we don't hate women in our culture now, aren't y'all? We don't hate different races and stuff. And I'm glad our government's not pushing any of that, aren't y'all? It's, all, it's always Satan. It's Satan. Always has been him. So here's this woman. She comes in the middle of the day. We find out later the reason she comes in the middle of the day in the heat of the day by herself is because she's not welcome in any groups back in, 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 in town because she's been married five times or living with people. So she comes out there. It's just her and Jesus. He looks at her and he said, would you please draw me a little water? Let me have a drink, please. It's been a long day. Her first reaction is, why would you ask me to do I'm a Samaritan woman, and the Jews hate Samaritans. You, in other words, what she's saying is, don't y'all consider us unclean? You don't want to take any, I don't, I, I don't want to give you water. You, you'll spit it out, because that's what any other secular Jew would have done. He looks at her, and he said, ma'am, if you only knew who you were speaking to, you would drink of the water that I can give you. It's living water. And whoever drinks of it will never die. Hashem. Behold, El Shaddai. With the waters in his hand. With the waters under his feet. Look at him walking on the waters. Who is this that calms the storms and speaks to the wind and calms the waves? Oh, you of little faith, you don't know who I am yet. Who else could do this, guys? Think. That's what he's saying to them. Thank you, brother. Guys, are y'all hearing me? 
This is stuff most of the world doesn't know or doesn't get. This is stuff that 60% of the preachers are admitting they ain't even going near it. This is the stuff that when some of them hear this, they go, that, that, that preacher's crazy. No. It's all historically recorded. Nothing crazy about it. You just don't want to believe. You got the same demon on you those ancient Jews and Romans had on them. I'm putting it right before your face, folks, and I'm telling you this. In this year that we're living in, this world that we're living in, I'm telling you this. I'm glad that the one I serve walks on the waters and calms the waves. He calls me out upon the waters where sometimes my faith is tempted to fail. What do you think we sang that for this morning? I'm not going to say who. I saw a couple faces sitting out here looking like, well, I wish we'd hurry up and get this over with. If you only had known, you would have been singing that to the top of your lungs. You were singing about what I just preached. You were singing about what the whole Bible talks about from Genesis to Revelation. We live in the storm of life, folks. It is a fallen world. Can you not see it? And God calls us out upon those waters with him in the person of Jesus Christ. Why? We are his representatives. We are his Noahs. We are his Lots. We are his Deborahs. We are his Esthers. We are his, his on and on, you name the, the, the women, the men that, that were just witnesses in the midst of the storms of their day. And God is saying, look, you're living in the most prophetic times since my first coming on earth in the flesh. Nothing has been more prophetic since then than where you are now. And I'm calling you out on these waters and you have nothing to fear. I am the one that speaks to the wind and the waves. And you're on my side. And I'm on your side. I am his and he is mine. Remember the last words of the song? And because of that, you win. I know how to get you to the other side. And I will get you there. And you will be glad. There's coming a day, he's saying, when I will speak to the wind again, the wind of Satan's wrath. And I will say, shut up, be still. You're done, you're toast. Amen. And I will speak to the waves roaring around you. And I will say, it is done. And the sky will be rolled up like a scroll. And the stars will fall from the heavens. And everything will be made new. Amen. Jesus said, I have done this. That's why he cried out on the cross his very last words. It's finished. Oh, the game's still going. But the clock's winding down. It is finished. Revelation 12, 12. And Satan is filled with rage. Because he knows his time is short. Behold, El Shaddai is walking on the waters and he ain't even leaving a footprint behind. Bow your heads with me.